Hello and welcome, this is Karol Schmink from the Advanced Threat Solutions team. And today we'll do a little threat hunting and incident response exercise using uh, ThreatGrade, m 4 endpoints and Cisco Threat Response. Let's start by working on some indicators. So there is an indicator that uh, I found pretty interesting. It's called script created an executable file. And it's one of those where you have uh, a script like a JavaScript that the users might be forced to execute, um, creating additional executable files that represent other stages of the malicious infection. So let's take a look at this one. And we see that it has a default score of 95. So I'll be doing a search for that indicator. I can just paste it in like this. Uh, and by default, it's doing 30 days back and looking at all samples. And obviously there is quite a few of those samples. And these are samples from anywhere in the world that whoever submitted a file and marked as public. I'm more interested in samples that are coming from my organization. So I'll adjust the search accordingly. And we can see that it's a one file that um, was spotted. Let's take a look what this actually was. Why was this at the end labeled as a threat score 100? And perhaps it's a technique that we want to prevent in the future. So at this point, I want to introduce the concept of case books. It's this blue icon that uh, functions like an overlay and it actually works across the portfolio. So it's available in M4 endpoints, threat grid and other products that we have. And it allows you to create these small investigations. The investigation can have a name. And as we go along, we'll just be adding indicators to it. And those indicators could be IP addresses, domains, SHAs, and so forth. So first, let's take a look at the at the report itself. So as the file got analyzed, we see that the overall score turned out to be 100. So there was probably a lot more happening. And more importantly, we have one internal target. So that means there's one machine probably running M4 endpoints that saw that file. So that now it gets more interesting in our case. Before we dive into the machine, we have the host name of the machine here. Let's first take a look what the file is actually doing. And there's um, two ways to do this. Either we go over what the file was doing in terms of file activity, registry activity, or we go through these behavior indicators, which kind of pinpoint the interesting uh, stuff from the report. So I'll be doing just that. First of all, we see this Bifrost default mutex detected. So a mutex that corresponds to a piece of malware, it's actually a remote access Trojan. Um, the description clearly states that it's quite capable of doing screen captures and key logging. So the presence of the mutex is enough to mark this as a, you know, having a score of 100. And there's also this uh, executable file that is uh, related to it. Okay, what else is there? We see artifacts being flagged by antivirus. And then there's this bits admin execution detected. And bits, ad bits admin is a legitimate piece of software, uh, part of the operating system that allows to do asynchronous transfers, pretty much to download files from the internet. And quite often it is misused. So the presence of this is an indicator of its own. And we can also see the command line, which reveals what it was actually downloading. So it was downloading this executable, which corresponds to the executable that is labeled as Bifrost. So the Bifrost got downloaded from this URL and getmalware.com. And so we are already starting to collect interesting uh, pieces of evidence. So we have the file name and we also have the, the domain. So what we might do is um, just look at the artifact section and just grab the artifact like that and say, okay, let's add it to my current casebook. Done. And let's do the same for the domain here. Uh, 
this get malware.com on this uh, fairly high port. So what we can do is just to grab that URL and add it to our casebook. If we open it up, we see that we have the, the domain here. It's, a, it's the, actually the entire URL as well as our malicious file. Okay, uh, so let's get this out of our way and see if there are any other indicators. There's a few. Uh, one that caught my attention is um, the persistent mechanism here. Uh, it's always good to know how the malware keeps persistent on the endpoint. And here it's done through um, registry key. So we have the, the, the machine hive and within that there's this path that leads to a run key and eventually the, the value of that key is this overdrive exes. Now, we probably won't see this file because it's a different file. It might be a copy of the malware. And if we take a look at how the processes worked, when this got analyzed, we may not see it. So first we have our script. That script created DXC with the help of bits admin, of course. That was the delivery mechanism of it. And then we see uh, this file also launching a couple of CMDs, uh, probably to do all sorts of changes to the operating system and on all additional pieces. But we don't see the other file. And the reason is because this file was um, created in registry key, and this will only be active when the machine gets restarted. It's our persistence mechanism. Okay, so we now have a quite a good understanding of what this um, piece of malware is doing and we have collected a few pieces. Now it is time to take a look at the N4 endpoints to see what was actually happening on our endpoint and there might be things that are slightly different or that even got blocked. So let's take a look at that. There are a couple ways to do it. One is to just go to the host name there and We can just search it, and there it is. Okay, before we go into the trajectory view, let's review the events first for this machine. And by default, this is done for 30 days. Obviously, you may choose a different time range if you like so. Um, we see there are some events that I might not considering interesting when looking only at the security relevant incidents. So what I might do is uh, only go for detected threats and indicators of compromise. Now let's give it a couple of seconds before it's actually applied and we should have a um, slightly reduced list and sometimes this re reduction can be significant. So now we have six individual events and there are two groups. One, indicators of compromise and two are the actual detections that resulted in a um, successful current at the end. And what are those? So first, the indicators of compromise. So these are things that should not happen on the system that is healthy, but there are certain cases in which they are, they're just fine. So it, it's not a case where you could administer block right away, but you want the analysts to, to know that these were there. So, and then there are your detections that uh, should result in a block, right? So this is what we should be seeing. Let's take a look at the device trajectory. And uh, I'll be looking at the new device trajectory since it's a little faster and more streamlined. Um, I'm gonna move it a little and let's take a look what was happening here. So there are a couple of, um, you know, suspects here. First, what we see right off the bat is uh, this file, the same name of the file. And this file actually got blocked. So the entire execution chain didn't happen here because we see that this piece of malware is already known bad as it was downloaded and it was blocked right away. That is a good thing, 
right? So there's at least part of the malware that got blocked. Now, before that, just before that, we have those indicators, those warnings that something is happening here. So let's review those. First, we have um, a script creating an executable and launching it. And in this case, uh, the, um, the command line arguments reveal that the script interpreter was fed this invoice JavaScript file. And that led to creation of executables. Then we also have this fake extension, uh, something that I also noted. You see this dog.js default Windows behavior is to hide known JS extension. So users, th uh, users see the doc and think that they are opening a document. Combine that with a nice looking document icon and yeah, you know, you got the mechanism for launching um, an executable code. And here our here goes our friend Bits Admin. So this was one of the um, and we know this from the thread report. This was one of the delivery mechanisms. A legitimate component this was misused. Uh, the command line arguments here, you know, give it away. It's, it's the same thing. So the domain gets malware.com payload. And here goes our um, malicious executable. Uh, there are a couple other things that happened around this time, so let's review those. So here goes our bits admin. Yes, we saw that. And how got the bits admin created or executed? Sorry, through the W script. So yes, so we can we can see this this again was very in line with what we saw on the thread grid side. So we saw that the the W script uh, was actually launching the delivery mechanism and and it's the invoice and the invoice actually the original zip is here as well we can see that the zip was created by internet explorer right so user downloading this of their web-based email client or from the internet and uh, the last bit that I see is that the W script itself got executed from Explorer. Very likely this is a user unpacking the zip file using just the native Windows uh, unzipping functionality. So this is how it, it's manifested here on the trajectory. So we have quite a few pieces. I just want to demonstrate that we can use the casebook here as well. And uh, let me open the case that we were looking at, which is this invoice case. And let's add a couple of other things to it. So first is the bits admin here. So what I will do is just to copy the SHA and I can show you that you can also add SHAs. In this case, it's a clean Clean SHA, we know that this is a misused component, so there's there will be no reason to mark it as malicious because there are thousands of other users that are just legitimate. Okay, so at this stage we understand what the malware is doing on a you know on the general basis when run in the virtualized environment. We also know how it was behaving on our particular machine. We have traces that Part of the malware was already blocked and very likely the the ultimate payload was blocked. Um, but yet what we do see here is the attempt to create a file several times properly done by the script. So the obvious next steps would be to try to get hold of the script and see what it's actually doing. Or if it's something else, uh, you know, we might be safer uh, wiping this machine. But looking at what we have, and this is a good enough visibility, uh, we see that the uh, M4 endpoints actually did a good job uh, detecting and blocking the ultimate payload of this infection. The last thing I want to show you is the collected evidence and how it looks in the Cisco threat response. So first of all, we do see that um, everything gets automatically enriched with file names and paths and there's a clear color distinction between legitimate, suspicious, 
and malicious observables. Next, there are these links, which represent various relationships, and there are quite a few. And lastly is the set of these target endpoints, so machines in our environment. So the next step of our investigation was, hey, let's take a look across our uh, install base plus across Cisco intelligence to see what we can, what we can uh, capture. And apparently there's one more machine that has been touching the same malicious domain that we have uncovered in the investigation. So this might even span into a slightly larger infection than what we originally thought. Uh, let me just highlight a few important pieces here. First is that the observables are mentioned here at the end, and for each we have judgments being the individual dispositions that were given at a um, particular point in time, and the verdict being the latest and currently active disposition. So we see that we have three systems reporting to us, M Global Intelligence, Umbrella giving malicious both, and then Tunnels Intelligence giving suspicious um, disposition. The graph also represents how common this is in the environment and globally, how many hits do we see per each observable. The investigation can always be changed and you can add um, pieces to it from other sources. It's intelligent enough that it will automatically parse SHAs and URLs and, and um, IP addresses from, from text that you can grab from like a blog. And any of those pieces is actually clickable as well. So you can either pivot from from the system to M frame points, thread grid, umbrella directly. And in some cases, you can even struck the systems to do something for you. For example, in case of M4 endpoints, we can add a particular SHA to the quick block list, pretty much. So that would block it right away. So I hope you can see the power of having all the Cisco threat intelligence in one place and how this can augment your threat hunting and incident response practices by first working through, let's say, a very broad indicator, uh, then using our integrations to reveal that there might be one or few cases where this was already seen, and then combining the analysis done using ThreadGrid as well as the visibility of M4 endpoint to realize what was actually happening on the endpoint and the potential of the infection as well, and eventually uh, collecting enough evidence to build a case that might then um, allow you to uncover that this is something larger, that there might be more machines involved. All right, that is all from me, and um, thank you very much for your attention, and see you sometime soon.